It is time. Welcome to today's webinar on the happiness trifecta brought to you by CCW Digital and Conduit. I'm Brian Cantor, Principal Analyst for CCW and your host for today's discussion. The economy is uncertain. Budgets are tight. Issues are more complex than ever. We've all heard these challenges. We know these challenges, and we know the difficulty of operating a contact center in today's environment. But if you think your customers or your employees or your business stakeholders are going to give you a pass just because things are challenging, you're very incorrect. You see, today's customers are not simply looking for their questions to be answered. Agents are not simply looking for a consistent paycheck. Businesses are not just simply looking to control the costs of the contact center and avoid brand risks. They expect you to deliver value. They expect you to form true, meaningful human connections. They demand that you achieve happiness, all while being as convenient, streamlined, and profitable as possible. Now, I'm not going to lie to you and say that any of this can happen with the snap of a finger, but I am going to let you in on a little secret. It's not as hard to achieve as it may seem. The key is to treat customer, employee, and brand outcomes as a unified project. When you recognize how complementary and interrelated these areas are, you'll find yourself taking actions that are going to make everybody happy, everybody thrilled, and they're going to do so. You're going to form those connections without breaking the bank. Your customers are going to be loyal. Your employees are going to be engaged and empowered, and your brand will be stronger, more popular, and more successful than it ever was previously. Now, this webinar is about getting there and building this happiness trifecta. And I can't wait to dive into a discussion that will be rich with insights and stats and examples and recommendations for how you can make all facets of the context center operation as strong as possible. To kick things off, though, I want to start by introducing our speakers. So I'm going to start with Ryan. So Ryan, thrilled to have you here. I know you have a tremendous amount of insights about what this all means for the customer experience and how that trickles back to business results. But before we get into those insights, tell us about yourself and your interest in this topic. Thanks, Brian. Yes, it's it's great to be here today. Um, this is something that's near and dear to me. I, I absolutely love these subjects because it, it intertangles all of the things that make a contact center beat. It's it's so important to have the aspects of brand and what we're looking at from a culture perspective. And then, of course, the overlaying technology that, that drives the whole thing. And for myself, uh, being inside of the contact industry for 20 plus years, it's been a real evolution, an evolution of um, the last couple of years, really seeing how COVID has changed and, and really asked for people to, to look at things in a different way. It's also driven some of the stuff um, that maybe wasn't quite as important before to the top. And I, I'm really looking forward to the conversation. I've been conduit a little over three years, uh, vice president of operations and very happy to be here today. Well, we're happy to have you. And with the experience you just outlined, as well as that clear passion and perspective on the topic, I know you're going to have a lot of great things to share. But you're not the only one with great things to share. We also have Bonnie here. Bonnie and I have worked together in the past and always have great discussions. I don't think today will be any different, but maybe when you share your background with the audience and your thoughts on this topic, they'll be as confident as I am. Thank you, Brian. And great to see you as always. Uh, my name is Bonnie Tishman. I lead marketing for actually our human capital practice at Conduent. Previously led marketing for our CX practice um, at Conduent. So definitely have some great perspectives across EX and CX. And I think I actually am one of the people that invented experience and transformation because I have been talking about this for years. And I am so incredibly thrilled that the market is finally gaining traction, understanding it, making investments, and we're starting to see true transformation. So I've been doing this for about 25 years, Brian. I've been with a lot, uh, a lot of, um, I'll say consultancies and outsourcing providers um, in product roles, consulting roles, as well as marketing. And um, I'm hoping that I'll be able to provide some insights to our audience today, just to change their mindset, think differently and make a difference. You may be hoping, but I know you will, and I can't wait to tap into those <laughs> insights. You. So. You know, we have a, a multifaceted discussion here, but ultimately by the end of it, we're going to get to the point where you are building that happiness trifecta. You're not simply looking for little corners you can cut or little efficiencies you can gain. You're really looking to transform the way you think about customers, employees, and the overall brand to ensure that every moment is great, 
but more importantly, those moments come together to perform, to create a brand that is going to inspire employees, attract customers and grow revenue at a time when, you know, just like I said, just because things are challenging doesn't mean standards are going down. If anything, customers want more employees need more. And with that, we have to make sure that we're delivering real value. And I know this happiness trifecta is a way to get there. So starting off, I want to focus on really what this means for the contact center and how it has to evolve. Now, you know, we know this is not just a job for the contact center. We know that it truly does take the entire business to make concepts like customer centricity and employee centricity a reality. But that said, we can't ignore that the contact center is the centerpiece of this. It does play a huge role in driving these experiences. And we also know that it is where a lot of change and challenge has been felt in recent years from, and certainly in recent months as well. And this is new customer expectations, new channels, new ways of working, and a lot of new technology out there. So from Ryan, there's, from Ryan's perspective, there's a lot that we have to focus on, a lot of change, a lot of challenge. What do our listeners need to know about how they can transform their contact centers spanning people and process and technology to really kind of achieve that duality of efficiency and customer satisfaction? Thanks, Brian. Yeah, I, I think what we've really been focused on over the last few years is is really zooming in on on the UX side of things. So so how do we take the a lot of attention goes into customer journey mapping and and friction points in in the customer journey. And and that I will never um, argue is, is is a big part of what we do. But we've really started to focus on the application side and our own internal uh, employee friction points and how they're interacting with systems and how those systems in turn impact the ability to deliver an exceptional, exceptional customer service um, outcome. And part of that has been, we've really started on the front end, um, getting into some of the onboarding tools, but also a lot of attention has gone into the training aspect. How do we continually push for a curriculum to be current, make sure that it's relevant. We do a lot of seasonal ups and downs. And through those ups and downs, we go through product launches. We go through um, different rollouts of different systems and different tools. Keeping people informed and up to date is, is vitally important. But when they come out to the floor, are those tools as up to date as they need to be from the training aspect? Um, we know there's gaps there. And the tools themselves, are they sitting on a call looking for information? Are they seeing some friction points internally where you know, things that would just be easy to get at aren't aren't as quick and as efficient as they need to be. So we've really started to take the, the inside out approach. So yes, the customer journey, vitally important, but how are the friction points within our own uh, employees and things that they're seeing in the customer tools impacting the ability to, to give that customer experience? And we have really tried to take it down to, if the tool is causing the problem, how do we make it so that not only do we work on the tool and the outcome of it, but that personalized experience of someone coming in and feeling like this person has the information they need, they have a connection with me, and they're able to hold a conversation just like you and I are today without the pauses and delays and the in the kind of the, the mute button to go look and search through something that they may not be able to kind of pull down um, as quickly as they can. So we've spent a lot of time just focused in on, hey, customer journey is vital, but what about the employee journey and how they're able to interact with folks? And we spent a lot of time with customers just really focused in on, let us take a look at your tools, let us examine your training, and we're gonna kind of take that over for you and give recommendations on how all of those things come together. You got big clients with three, four, five different big towers of businesses, and they've really built those towers up in, in different silos and training is different, curriculum is different, and tools are different. And we've really found a lot of synergies in trying to take some of those barriers down for them and figure out ways to make that as frictionless as possible. And that in turn has allowed for a lot of our employees to get not only better at CSAT, but just have a more human conversation and be able to interact with customers without having to worry about the noise in the background. You know, it's funny, Ryan, I sort of asked the question thinking you might focus more about the customer side, but the fact that you instantly went to the employee experience and how connected everything is really speaks to why we're having this discussion, right? I mean, we've all been on those calls. We've all had those interactions where 
the agent tells us, I really want to help you, but I can't for some reason. Either their company doesn't empower them to do so, they don't have the right tools, they don't have the right training. And ultimately what happens is the customer suffers. And so we cannot be thinking about how to overcome context center challenges, how to meet the standards of today's customers without thinking about the employee experience. And so, Bonnie, I know this has been a huge focus for you. This is something you're passionate about, which is as you're looking at this holistic user experience, what role the employee experience plays and what we need to do right now to start to adapt to trends in the market. So we'd love for you to share some insights you have on that. Thank you, Brian. So the first thing I'm going to say is what we need to do right now is recognize that we have a problem <laughs> because the industry has been really slow to adapt design thinking, human-centered design, workforce experience design. So Ryan talked about all the practical aspects of it and how to get it right. And, and companies like ours who work with so many organizations, we're starting to make progress there. The thing that's missing, and, and actually we just did some research. I know you do a lot of research, Brian. We just did some research on employee experience that we actually just launched this week, and it's called Humanizing HR. So you can imagine what we focused on. But essentially, one of the top things that organizations believed is most important to deliver great experiences, and one of the things they do the worst at is human-centered design. So let me just give you a couple of examples. So Brian talked the practical, he talked the technology, he talked productivity, et cetera. What we forget about is that people are people. We, we forget about that. And you know what, if you woke up in the morning and you had a bad night's sleep, it's going to affect your, your performance. So people are people and they carry that to work for them, with them. And so some work that I've done in the past is I've done consulting, you know, worked on a trans workforce transformation is actually looking at, I'll say the friction points as Ryan talked about, but looking at it as, um, I'll say more art, more art than science, looking at the process at a, as a whole, looking at the points that we have the happy face and what are those points where you know we have issues. And I'll give you two examples just because people who are listening in actually may have some examples that are similar. So example number one, we worked with a client that they found their productivity in the morning was down and it actually peaked after lunch. That never happens. People always, right? Always you get the after lunch people and then they wanna go home. What was going on? And what we found, so this, this takes interviews, this takes understanding. So beyond the data, take some you know, um, you know, immeasurable data, I guess you can say. Um, but it, what we found is that there was a parking lot that was about a mile away from the center. And there was a shuttle bus that took people to the center. Guess what happened if they missed that shuttle bus? They were either an hour late for work or they ran. Sometimes they ran in the rain. What does that do to productivity when you walk in the door? Huge, huge impact on how they were treating their customers. And so again, obviously shuttle bus ran a little differently <laughs> after we had this aha moment. And I had another one, um, onboarding, as, as we know, how many, how many agents, what, what's the experience of agents leaving within the first 30, 60, 90 days? We had this one organization that thought it would be great if every employee flew to their, their headquarters for the first week of work as part of onboarding, feel the culture, meet all the executives. The contact center employees hated it. They didn't get it. They didn't embrace it. It was a waste of time, waste of money. So again, understanding a little bit of that art, putting the employee in the center of that actual process makes a complete difference as you're as you're trying to deliver happy experiences to your customers. So um, you know, so again, I don't I don't know if Ryan, you have any other examples that you would want to add there or, but I mean that's what we're starting to see is also thinking about how people are people. Yeah, and I'll I'll throw in with the um the, I think the the aspect of how you interact with somebody and the the expectation of where that bar is now is significantly higher. Like one of the things that that has really changed, I think, directionally is the the conveyor belt approach of you will always have the next person to fill that seat. The the industry itself sometimes gets a black eye with, um, you know, it's it's a large industry. It has it has its turnover problems, and part of what we're really trying to take a step back on is is the culture of what we do does not have to be looked at as such a um, a difficult job 
there is no doubt that the the day to day grind of of being tied to a cord and being at your desk is hard. But our our job in between the times of of difficult calls, tough customers, connecting is to make sure they feel a part of something. And part of I think that journey that that we've really been on over the last few years is is making sure the connection from day one is felt. And if if you really want to understand somebody, um, you can talk KPIs. 500 times, you can have that conversation over and over again. But the second you start to morph conversations away from KPIs and start talking to them about their day, their life, um, how they interact um, day to day with family, things that are happening in the background that you may or may not be aware of is the second that you unlock something that will keep them sticky in your org for much longer than any KPI or any, any type of incentive will ever last. And you know, a lot of people say they they stay to work with their boss and, you know, not not for the money. I think what we found out over the last few years with some heavy investment in, in both tools and tech, especially with the, the work um, being pushed to the at-home environment was it doesn't matter where the work is done. People need the human connection at another level. And the second that you start creating that inside of this environment is the second that you start to unlock something that is just different and unique and you have people who are willing to go the extra mile and that brand recognition for whatever company that we're, we're helping from a servicing standpoint now becomes our brand first, their brand second. And we create almost a, a super agent who feels connected to both. And when you start doing that, um, you really got something great, so. Yeah, and I think both of you hit on two very important trends and how they're shaping the employee experience. The first is, we know, and we'll dive into this a little bit later, but we know that customers are increasingly looking for personalization and human connections. And if that's going to happen, you have to treat your employees like humans too. You have to think about their needs because you're whatever you know that whatever you do behind the scenes is what's trickling down to the customer. And if they're just treated as disposable, replaceable people who follow the same protocols, read off the same script every day, then that's the service you're going to be giving your customers. If you want them to connect with them as people, you have to first see your employees as people as well. The second thing, and Bonnie, you brought up a great point because you know a lot of people, and we've seen some research, I think all of us know this anecdotally, a lot of us know that brands have struggled to truly connect employees in the remote, remote world. They know that they might be getting their work done, but they don't always feel part of that organization. But clearly in your example, just sort of forcing them into one location and thinking that's enough was not enough. You know, people are not just going, you can't just take these shortcuts. Oh, we're in the office. We have a nice office. We have people together. Suddenly everyone feels like they're part of the culture. It has to be much more in the way you design experiences, the mechanism you have for listening to what your employees want and the way you set your priorities so that, yes, if they're in the office, they can make friends, they can see each other great. But if they're working remotely, they still know what's going on and they still feel connected. That is really where human centricity comes into play. And something I know is going to be a defining part of our conversation throughout the remainder of this webinar. And one area where that does come into play is the digital world. So, you know, thus far, we've talked a lot about how, you know, you don't get to say, oh, the budget budgets are tight, so we're going to deliver an inferior experience. You have to control costs, but you also have to be good. And another area where you can't really make this trade-off is in digital, where, you know, yes, we know that digital channels should be improving convenience. They should make experiences more simple and scalable. But what they can't do is sacrifice human connections. And Bonnie, I know this is something you've actually built a model on that really allows us to understand as we start to look at our different channels and how they come together in an omni-channel journey, you know, how we can still inject humanity throughout this entire journey and ensure that customers don't have to choose between ultra fast or ultra human, but instead can always get the right experience for them. Yeah, so thanks for entertaining me, Brian. You know that these graphics that, <laughs> that we're sharing now are um, near and dear to my heart. So I'm gonna talk a little um, philosophy methodology here just to know, just so I can explain how we, we, where we were and where we need to get to. So classically, we've all been in the contact center space for years. Classically, when you think about transactions and you think about what should be digital versus you know, what should be live agent, you look at the complexity of the transaction and you look at the volume. Right. And and as complexity starts to go up, you know, you try to, you know, as much as you can, you try to solve as much in a digital channel, but then you know you have to push it, you know, to to a human. Um, the part that's missing that we have started to really weave into the theme of this overall conversation is humanity. It's no, it, it's not a two-dimensional world, it's a three-dimensional world. 
So if you, you know, if you think about, you know, the, the, the next graphic and it's more of a rubric, rubric, you have to add emotional um, context. You have to add human centricity into the fold. So not only how complex is it, but how emotional is it? How sensitive is it? And I love to use this model that was developed by a, a firm called Mercer Leapgen. We actually worked with them on our HR research recently, um, but they call it hands, heads, and hearts. So you think about the hands, the transaction, how fast can I get it done? You think about the head in terms of how much do I need to know in order to resolve that request? And then how much compassion do I need to have? And what we're really finding now is that that also adds a new element to the omni-channel experience. And it's something called hybrid. It's not as simple as just, you know, just digital, just human, but there are a lot of transactions that actually fall in the middle and do better there, even if they're complex. And I'll give a quick example. And then I know Ryan probably has a thousand, but you know, we we have a lot of clients that are either in the insurance space or healthcare or you know, wealth and retirement. We are uh, we have clients that we work with that are, you know, people that are looking at their funds or getting ready to retire. I don't necessarily want to talk to someone out of the gate. I might want to do my research. I might want to understand what options that I have. I need to, I need that data, right? in order to be able to assess that. But then at some point in that journey, I may really need to talk to someone now. And that that, that scenario may be different for a 20 year old than someone who's 58 or you know, when the market's crashing, right? Where it becomes a very emotional situation. They have to make some really quick decisions now. How are they gonna prepare for retirement? So, so giving people the right tools, but also thinking about different parts in that journey, going back to human-centered design, at what point in that journey do you have to at least offer that option that this is a time where you really do need to think about that human element? And then even through the process, talking, even the digital tools need to talk like a person. Hi, you know, you know, is this, do you want to speak to someone now and really guide them through the journey? Because people really do expect to be treated that way. And I'll add one more point. Sorry, I have to, I, I love research, but one more, one more point is, as you know, Brian, we launched our CX research last year. Um, and that one um, was called Channeling Happiness. And it, it really comes down to, from the consumer perspective, they expect that experience, whether they expect it to always be conversational, even if it's digital, otherwise it's a fail. And they actually really responded more that great experiences meant more to them than even having their issue resolved. Right, so that whole happiness factor, you know, the world has changed. Ryan said at the beginning, you know, COVID, we hate to talk about it, but it was a milestone in our history and it changed what consumers and employees both expect. Yeah, and just to jump in, I think that's gonna be even more important now because we know we can do all the research that says all brands care about wowing their customer. They're still prioritizing the customer experience, but we know budgets are a real thing. And we know that there are gonna be cases where companies are going to have to say no to customers and making sure that you're saying no, but still providing a great experience, that's going to be the key to not losing them as a result of that no. So I think that right now, especially considering no matter what your answer is going to be, no matter what channel it's going to be in, ensuring that you're demonstrating that humanity, that empathy, that concern for the customer, that is going to be how you win business, keep business and ensure that you can succeed no matter the economic landscape. You know, Ryan, I know that Bonnie teed you up for some potential examples, so I'm going to do the same right here. Yeah, and I, I just want to throw in on, I I think omni-channel sometimes, it's, it's, it's meant to be this all-encompassing kind of experience. And I think a lot of, of not just the partners that, that we work with, but in general, the industry, it kind of gets into this set it and forget it mode sometimes. And one of the things that, that I like to really challenge on is, is to me, how seamless is the experience? And are you really able to go from one channel to another? Are you equipping the tech? I mean, we've, we've met with companies that have hundreds and hundreds of toll-free numbers. You know, just out of a, at a starting point, you're not making it easy to get to the right person, right? I mean, just, just conceptually out of the gate, you're, you're not making it easy. But then is that experience really personalized? We say it a lot. People say, you know, you want this personal experience, but are you using the data to truly get to a personal experience? When is the last time that somebody picked up the phone or had a chat with somebody 
and they gave them a bit of a surprise. They, they gave them something that was like, wow, you really knew something about me or you looked beyond it. And I think what, what we're trying to drive customers towards and, and really push hard on is the interaction that you're having now, as vital as that is, is almost secondary to the, the reason they may contact you again or the reason that they may hang up the phone or hit end on that chat and say, wow. And, you know, there's a lot of companies that, you know, whether you're buying furniture and you, you download the app and you take a picture of your living room and you want to put a couch in there, you're seeing the visual representation. They may take that same experience and go to the store or call the contact center and they have no idea what they just spent an hour and a half doing, you know, personalizing themselves. And I think some of the things that that we try to encourage customers on and one example would be, you know, don't use it in an emergency situation to become personalized or to become flexible. You know, we've done a lot of high touch stuff where we're like, you know, you can look at this a different way. You can drive sales into this market or, you know, we've had a situation in the past where, you know, one of our, our big hospitality clients was forced to, to get into a situation where there was lots of cancellations and we drove volume into different channels to help enable that to happen quickly. All great things, but all things that I think right now we we want to challenge that next level. And that's make the conversation one and make it seamless. Omnichannel is only as good as the data in front of you. And if you take those little nuggets and those little footprints of, of customers and tie it back into the next, next experience, or even better, try to predict what the next experience is going to be and cut it off. That's, that's where we're driving customers towards. And that's, that's what gets me excited about Omnichannel is that next evolution of, yes, there's five ways to contact you, but we've brought, bridged all those together into to one experience. And that really perfectly encapsulates Bonnie's point that like, no matter how objectively simple or complex the issue is, no matter where it's happening, there's still an opportunity to personalize and demonstrate humanity. And not only that, but if you're anticipating, okay, they have this problem today, so I'm guessing they're going to have that problem next Thursday. Then by being able to predict that, you're not only creating recognition, you're not only showing that you value the customer and care about them, but you are also creating an efficiency too, because you're preventing them from needing to call. So you're now saving their time, you're saving your own agent's time as well, and you're preventing them from getting upset, which means that you're creating a stronger likelihood of keeping that customer and not having to invest in more customer acquisition. So in both cases, you know, by being more personalized, even in a digital world, even for transactional issues, you are creating a situation where the customer feels more valued and the business generates more value. And so ultimately it's a win-win for the organization. And that's really what kind of thinking about everything cohesively is all about. It's recognizing that when you do one of these things right, you're probably going to end up doing the other things right as well. When you start to kind of separate everything, that's where experiences fall flat and that's where you run into problems. So I think really helpful examples here. Now, speaking of the connection and thinking of everything together, we've all heard happy agents equal happy customers. We know that that is among the biggest cliches in our space, maybe second only to the customer is always right. And I don't think that's, certainly that's still true. We wouldn't be having a webinar called Building the Happiness Trifecta if we didn't think agent happiness was still important. But my challenge here is whether that's enough, because we know that as customer interactions are going to become more complex, as customer expectations are going to become stronger and they're expecting more, that it's going to take more than just a very happy agent to keep them satisfied. This agent's going to have to have more skills. They're going to have to have more emotional intelligence. They're going to have to have more comfort working off a script and thinking critically to keep this customer happy. Now, that means that we're going to have to change who we think about recruiting, change what the role of the agent looks like in an organization. And we can want to do that, but Bonnie, that doesn't mean we're ready to do that. You know, contact centers do have a lot of gaps that they have to close to meet this demand and ensure that they're able to attract and retain the right employees. So what are some recommendations you have here? Yeah, so I'm, I'm even going to take, thank you for teeing this one up because this is an important one. Even beyond the agent population, the whole customer service, how, you know, how do, because customer service, obviously it could be in a store, it could be in a center. So period. Um, so one stat that is true in the market is that 50 million people or more, I think it's closer to 51, voluntar voluntarily left their jobs last year. The year before it was about 48 million. So I know we hate, and, and I hate the cliches to the, you know, great resignation, but this is real. So, so making, you know, the employee happy or, you know, making sure it's a great environment 
this is real. We have a talent crisis. It's not that we don't, it's not that we have a labor shortage. We have a talent crisis. So expectations have changed. People do want, um, you know, as we're saying, they want to be treated differently at work. They want flexibility. They want great cultures. They want training. They want personal development. So a couple of things. Um, so number one, even going back to the whole omni-channel thing, as we think about the fact that there's now these hybrid interactions or that technology can do a much better job at the pure digital, that makes the agent role very different, right? Because now we have a super agent, right? So now they're becoming much more advocates, even brand advocates. We've always talked about brand advocacy, but it really does put a lot more pressure on the agents truly being of, of that kind of cali caliber, right? And that kind of quality. So, so that's number one. Um, and then number two, you know, as HR, I'll say HR and just overall recruiting organizations, et cetera, you know, what we're finding is that they're actually struggling more with retaining talent than they are with finding talent. So one thing I'll say there, just in terms of tips overall, and this is less on the skills, and I think Ryan might be able to fill in a little bit about what we're doing there. Um, but this is also just about thinking about, I'll, I'll call it your overall total rewards as an organization. Total rewards isn't just what you pay someone. It's not just the incentives. It's not just the pizza parties, right? It's also thinking about the culture. It's thinking about you know, do you offer them half Friday off once a month? It's thinking about how do you embrace their personal life? I'll say again, to have time to take their child to daycare and then, you know, be a human when they get to work because they did just go through that experience. So, so I'll say it's not just about the skills and the competencies, because if you do those other things, if you create the right culture, you create the right well-being, you're going to have a happier workforce who's going to deliver more and they're going to invest more because the other thing we're saying the other cliche and then i'm gonna I, I, i'd love for ryan to tell some stories but the other cliche really is also about the quiet quitting which again is not it's real it's not just a cliche there are a lot of people at work that are getting paid and they're just showing up for the job and there's nothing more i'll say detrimental to your brand and your organization, that someone who's just there and isn't real doesn't want to be there, right? Because it's almost worse than absenteeism because someone performing half-assed on the job is really detrimental. So again, thinking about the fact you need to create a well wellness workplace, a place that you know thinks about that you know that whole person and gives them and and also thinks about personalization of those particular programs is what's going to make you effective and deliver be better experiences both to your employees and to your customers. Yeah, and, and while you know it's true to your point that maybe finding great talent isn't as difficult as it may seem and that retention is the bigger challenge, there's still important stakes to retaining here because we know that as issues become more complex and we're expecting agents to have not only, you know, comfort using a computer and speaking on the phone but also the ability to really understand master products and have connections these, that takes time. It takes experience. It takes investment yeah. into a culture. And that's not something you can replace overnight. If your best agent who has two years of dealing with every question you were ever going to get and really understand what your customers want, if that person becomes so frustrated that they leave, you might be able to find people that technically have the a similar resume, but you have people that truly understand what you're doing enough to fill in for that person's shoes and not have a drop off in the experience. I would challenge no, the more personalized, empathetic, and human-oriented our experiences get, the harder it's going to hit you when you start to lose some high-quality talent. And so it's really important to keep them. The other thing to think about exactly. here is that, you know, you brought up a great point about how it's not just about, you know, the little superficial things you do to feign culture, but instead really thinking about everything together. That's true for a number of reasons. First, we know hybrid work, even if you have a really awesome office with bright windows and a cool break room and beer pong and stuff in the office, that might not actually be keeping people in place. Secondly, we know that that's all replaceable. You know, if you're just differentiating yourself based on a nice office or a nice bonus structure, guess what? Someone out there can pay 25 cents an hour more, invest in a slightly nicer desk for them, and then they're going to take your talent. You have to be thinking right. way more about what's going to build loyalty, what's going to mobilize them to perform at their highest capacity. And so, Ryan, that means I have a very challenging question for you here, which is that it's not just about theoretically wanting to empower employees. You really have to think about a variety of different factors and processes that shape the overall work environment. And while you're doing that, you have to account for 
changes in where people are working. You have to think of generational differences and cultural differences about what they value and kind of create this very cohesive and very compelling employee experience. So how do you recommend breaking that all down? Yeah, I think it starts day one and, and day one being the, the actual cycle of, of recruiting the person. We spend a, a lot of time just the experience has to be personalized early on, right? So we, we went out and we got some technology that helped us from an onboarding perspective, allowing the autonomy of the person to select the time that they were available to do their onboarding. When they wanted to get their tools and their system set up, you know, we, we have an app out there that allows them to reach out and say, here's, here's the selection of my slot that I, I can do it. During the early stages of when they're coming on, you know, it's not just a matter of getting hooks into somebody, it's a matter of getting your brand out there and getting somebody bought into the company is not something that can happen in day one of training. It's got to happen throughout the, the entire cycle of, of TA and, and the onboarding team and getting them into, into the fold. If you can be successful at them understanding what your brand is in the early days, it'll help in the next four, six, eight weeks of the training process. Cause that training process is grueling a lot of the time, right? I mean, there's, there's long training periods. It usually <clears throat> can be quite cumbersome to get through that time. And depending on their level of expectation and, and of course their previous experience, um, you got to stay engaged throughout that whole process. And what we found too is, is deploying the right tools and allowing people um, the autonomy to kind of check in and say, Hey, here's how I'm doing today is one thing. But what we, what we really found was we're spending a whole lot of time not talking about the business. We're spending a whole lot of time talking about the culture of things. So for example, every two weeks, I have 22,000 people that, that are in my org. Every two weeks, we have an open town hall. And during that town hall, we, we don't talk about anything except culture. And we focus on culture and what is sticking and what is not. We challenge people to come uh, to the call and just tell and, and hold us accountable for how the culture is going through the entire org. And the reason that I do that is not because, um, you know, it's just something that I want to put a checkbox beside. It allows me to feel a part of whether or not the changes that we are making are truly rippling all the way through. And if you start influencing that at the top of the house, I now have team leaders who don't meet with folks and, and talk just KPIs anymore. They have culture meetings. We've taken the word team meeting kind of out of the vocabulary and switched it towards culture meetings every couple of weeks. And, and people need a break. It's a difficult job. It's not easy. And if you're conscious of some of those things that are going on and how you're reacting to the environment that you've put them in, give them the time to do the things that are important to them. Allow them time to talk about the things that they care and love. And, and again, you get to that point of having connection with someone where they just don't want to leave. It's not, it's no longer a dollar or two conversation. It's now a conversation over you make something in my life more valuable than it was before. You start doing those types of things and you've really identified ways to change again, kind of that stigma that's over the industry of, of people not caring, right? And, and being a number, but you have to do that all the way through. And yes, we've enabled a ton of tools and we've enabled a ton of things. People come in at the start of the day, we present them with five uh, faces. One's happy face all the way down to sad. They check it, that goes to their supervisor. We do some great analysis on attrition and data and how many times they click that sad face and did someone intervene? All of those things are fantastic. But at the end of the day, the conversation that we really focused on is, is moving away from just the direct kind of transactional KPI conversations into a fabric of, hey, this is our culture now. We want to have open meetings and just talk about the where things are going. And, and there's a million other things we can touch on here. But if I had to put a finger on one thing, it's two and a half, three years ago, we made a conscious decision on how we were going to approach this contact center industry work and the shift that we were gonna make in the approach that we handled um, all of our valuable people in. And I think that has paid off in spades. Our, our attrition numbers since the start of 2020 and where we are today, it's just incredible. The traction we've gotten by simply opening up the conversation to be different and, and not to just focus on the traditional things that, that call centers are, are great for, 
and have to be measured, but but changing that narrative altogether. Yeah, and I would almost the only thing I would maybe disagree with here is that, and I think you kind of answered this, but you mentioned how you're not having meetings just about business, it's about culture. But when you get the culture right, that's the probably the surest pathway to business success. I think Absolutely. you give people a, you know, you give people arbitrary metrics without context or without buy-in. Maybe you get compliance, but you don't get the heart behind it. You don't get the why behind it. You don't do what you're trying to achieve. When people instead understand, here's what we're fighting for. Here's what we're working together to achieve. Here's what matters. And here's why you matter as an employee. Then not only are they going to get that average handle time in check, not only are they going to get the right net promoter score at the end of the call, but they're going to do so with passion for what they're doing. Be open to how they can improve. Be listening to what the customer is saying and channel that feedback back to the organization. And that leads to better overall experiences. So again, culture is the number one thing you can do to achieve the right kind of context center, one that doesn't just answer calls, read scripts and process transactions, but one that truly builds connections. Absolutely. And you know, kind of for our last focus area, it really does sort of allow you to expand upon this concept, which is what does this all mean? So yes, we know that you know, we want to have great, pleasant interactions. We want the customer to smile. We want the agent to be happy when the call ends. But that's not really all a customer experience is about. It's not just about what happens in that interaction. It's what it means for the brand. And so, Ryan, walk us through from what you've seen, examples, just insights, how you kind of see this CX and overall brand connection happening and what that ultimately means for the way we need to approach strategy moving forward. Yeah, and I think, you know, one of the misconceptions is that I think you know, previously, a lot of folks would have said the CX portion, especially the call, call center portion, was, was a, a necessity and not so much something that um, drove either sales or revenue. And I think a lot of people have taken a giant step back and started to realize that you can take a lot of the CX stuff that we're doing today and tie it into both the marketing and sales strategy of the entire company. And, and part of what we're working with a lot of... Uh, a lot of our partners on is we want to be a fabric of everything they do. And, and, and the part of that is not just saying it, but, but what is your strategy over the next two to three years? How can we interweave some of the things that we're doing to help you lift that up? I mean, we, we had a conversation the other day just around, you know, a sales agent. Well, a sales agent has this stigma that a sales agent can't be um, a tech support person. And, and we're challenging that right now. Cause I think, I think part of that is if if we can if we can break down the barriers of, you know, you got to do four weeks over here for training for tech and you got to do four weeks over here for training for sales and you can't hire the same person for that. We we feel there's a real opportunity in the way that the contact center industry is going that you hire the right person who has the right flexibility and you can take those skill sets and make them more um, united across different brands or sorry, different cues then we create a brand loyalty that someone that sold you something can then kind of ricochet back and be the same person that supports your um, phone or tablet or whatever you bought. And you can have that personalized connection. And I think part of, of what we're starting to see now is there used to be a percentage of the, it was a cost uh, and a burden to carry a call center. Now it's something that we see a real opportunity to not only drive revenue and drive sales for our partners, but also become part of their brand that they're proud of. And I think that's a big step for us in the last few years is, is how do you not only service something, but become part of the fabric of what they're doing every day. And that's, that's been a big jump for us. We, we helped in the last couple of years, move some of our customers to self-serve. We were a big part of helping them get their self-serve platforms to where they need to be. And, Yes, at times, that's obviously the detriment to what we're trying to achieve. But we also saw that there was an opportunity for us to help them in different ways and to move platforms in different ways. And, and that's what we're about. It's, it's about finding ways for our partners to get better. And sometimes that's the benefit of, of them and the detriment of us. But also, we know the long-term game of this is the brand loyalty has to be the united front of what everybody's focused on. And, and that's the goal for us as, as the provider. Yeah, and I think that idea of this more consultative, all-encompassing agent is crucial for a number of reasons. One, it's just efficient because, you know, today the idea of having to transfer from department to department yes. just to get the right answer is very frustrating for a customer. Secondly, for the employee, I think it gives them a real sense of 
understanding all the different factors that could impact this customer's experience and making the right decision. If you're truly listening to their venting, you're finding out what's going wrong with their experience and you say, okay, well, you know what? If you just upgraded to an unlimited plan, you'd save money, you'd you know avoid all these hassles. And by the way, yes, my company would make money too. We want our agents capable of thinking about those sales opportunities. And on the other end of the spectrum, we don't just want them selling recklessly, but instead selling where they know it's going to help the customer and being able to explain to them, here's what this means from a customer experience standpoint. Here are some service issues you may run into so that they can establish that degree of trust and not just come across as that you know, cliche snake oil salesman who's just trying to make a quick buck. When everyone really understands the full spectrum of what the customer is going through, that's when one, the customer benefits because they're getting a trustworthy agent. Two, the agent benefits because they understand what that journey looks like and where the business can really be a true solution to their customers' problems. And that helps to achieve buy-in as well. Yeah. Now, and I think the the other side of the what you just said too, I, one of my my favorite bosses of all time said, love your angry customers. If, if you can find so much inside of, of customers who are dissatisfied with a product to, to guide exactly what you just said. And the more you pay attention to the folks who make the noise in the system, the better off you are trying to at least get down to the point of where those friction points are. And I think a lot of, of what we're doing now is trying to figure out how do we, how do we navigate some of those things you just said? It's, it's, it's the, so important that you understand where the churn is in your system. Because if you don't, and you you kind of turn a blind eye to it, you end up in a situation where we're not doing all we can to make sure that brand and that churn is reduced. Absolutely. Now, you know, we've talked a lot, Bonnie, you've sort of been our employee experience expert throughout the conversation. And I'm gonna challenge you with another question here because certainly with where we've come in this discussion, the idea of being people-centric and putting people first is a clear takeaway that we have. However, there's always that skeptical mindset out there that this is just, it makes for a harmonious work environment. It's a nice feel good endeavor who doesn't want to see smiling and happy and collaborative coworkers. But what does it really mean at the end of the day from a results standpoint? Is there value in focusing so much on the employee experience or is it just sort of like a nice to have? And so I know you think about this in terms of what it means for the brand experience, attracting customers, reputation, costs, revenue, all those factors. So what's your take on why this all matters? couple of answers to that one question, of course. Um, so number one, uh, I'll go back to our research from last year. So our CX research, um, one of our clear findings, I don't think this would be a surprise, but customers that had happy experiences spent 25% more. Customers who had bad experiences either left to find, you know, to go to another brand or I, I can't say they spent 25% less, but they were more likely to leave and go to another brand. So there's def there's a definite connection in terms of the customer's motivation if they have a good experience. Now that could be, you know, an agent or digital, of course, right? That, that might be either way. Um, I will also say that if you think about, as you measure results, you measure, you know, whether it's a program, whether it's a location, a store, et cetera, you typically look at, you know, what was our sales process? Um, you know, what, did we have top sales performers? What was our marketing program? You don't typically take that one step back and just look at what was the connection between are the employees engaged in this particular location or in this particular program? And um, these days, there's so much data out there, Brian. I mean, Gallup does polls and a lot of it is also the cost of disengagement and you know, what that cost is. But there, there was a recent Harvard Business Review study that looked at top performers. And it goes back to a lot of what you were saying about the skills earlier. But what they found is that performers in the top quartile, um, they performed 50% more revenue an hour. And top quartile was typically agents or, or sales representatives that had been there longer, that had more skills, you know, more longevity with the, with the organization and were overall more engaged. So, so think about the people that were in the next, the, the third quartile, if you just invested, if you took you know, that 50% of that revenue, took a piece of it and invested a little bit more in the people that were in the second and third, right? Reinvest that money, whether it's in training or programs or whatever it may be, well, there you go. You got more. You got more of that fifty percent pot. So there's so much out there these days, Brian. Just again, it's not that people don't recognize that it's there. I don't think they use those facts and data. So they're going to their 
you know, to their chief executive officers of an organization saying, our people are, are engaged. This is why we perform well. I don't think they're taking that next step of doing the correlations and the analysis and being able to actually look at that data. So that's the part, the data exists, right? We all do engagement studies, right? Or, or employee serve, SATS studies, the data is there. It's now taking it and telling the story around it. Yeah. And I think what you brought up, there's the direct connection, which is when you have employees that are happier, more engaged, they're going to perform better. Customers are going to be happier. There's also the indirect connection, which is when you build a reputation for being employee centric, that is just a net win for your brand. You think of some of the, you know, the coolest or hippest or most popular brands out there, a lot of them differentiate. Yes, they might have an awesome product, but they also differentiate based on how they treat their people and really creating true advocates within their organization. Because when a customer looks at your brand and they see, okay, you're paying these people well, or you're treating them well, or they're happy and they're engaged, that's a sign that, you know what, if I were to give this company my business, they're going to treat me well too. And that is a really, it's an infectious quality where at a time when there's so much competition out there, so many products that companies that are offering basically the same product for the same money. If you can differentiate by you have this really awesome brand that does have a happy, inspiring, engaging culture, that's going to help you stand out from that crowd. And that's going to help you win business at a time when we know it's so important to do so. So that was my third point that I forgot. Thanks for bringing it up. But it's social, right? It's all viral. So whether people go out on Glassdoor, whether people go out on Twitter, right? People do communicate now you know, through social media, social channels, and you're right, it becomes infectious, whether it's ab about, you know, employees wanting to join your organization, because they see there's a, go a good culture, yeah. or whether they want to even purchase or engage with your organization because of your culture and what you stand for. And in either way is a win. So yeah, you're absolutely right. Now, do want to have before we wrap in, I know we have some audience questions here. Before we get there, though, Bonnie, you brought up a very great point, which is that the data is there, the logic is there, the connection is obvious. It seems obvious, yet what do we actually do to materialize everything? What do we do to say, okay, I know I need to create happiness at all levels of my customer experience, and that's going to drive results, but how do I get there? How do I drive that happiness? And so, Ryan, starting with you, what are some actions or investments our listeners can take that will actually allow for more customer, employee happiness, or just better brand value and reputation? Yeah, I think that's that's the follow the breadcrumbs um, scenario again. It's 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 really important that the data that's out there and and we we spend a lot of time talking to customers over not whether or not they have the right data, but what they're doing with the data in order to direct it so that they can make the best business decisions. And it, and part of that gap in my eyes is. Yes, the, the experience and the reputation of what they're trying to do is always on the forefront, but the data and where it's pointing towards may not always lean towards what their brand is trying to do. And a good example of that is we had a whole lot of friction in a system um, the other day where we were just talking through um, how you were going to kind of navigate some of the basics on, on the customer coming in, them trying to get to a certain channel, the friction that they had getting to that channel, and all of the breadcrumbs that pointed towards the fact that um, there was a difficulty from the landing point to the, the exit point were all there, but they were just not paying attention to the fact that, that the data was pointing. They're very focused on, on everything else around it, all the noise in the system around you know, the ASA, how much time they spent in abandoned chats and all those things that, again, very important but not so much around how many times that person got stuck in, in that kind of no man's land. And part of what we've really tried to do is, is not so much um, be intrusive with this, but give us all the data that you have and allow us to make the observations of where we think this, um, where this channel is heading or where these things are going. And if you can get to a point of the experience being so much more seamless, and again, back to what we talked about earlier, even getting to that personalized, I believe most companies, not all, but most companies already have the data that they need. They just need the hands and the expertise to direct them towards, hey, have you looked over here? And, and we've really tried to get into that consultative type approach with a lot of our customers so that they can start to say, you know, we don't look at things this way. You know, what's another set of eyes going to hurt? And that's us. That's the other set of eyes that we can kind of come in and say, 
let's look at this, shake this tree a little different way and see what falls out. And I think that's where I would direct people to is the data usually tells the story. Most of the time the data is there. It's just that the way that you're consuming and processing that data may not always lead to the outcomes that, that you're looking for. And Bonnie, same question to you. Any, any recommendations you have for making this all come to fruition? Yeah, I guess I have to stay with the employee advocate <laughs> perspective since that's what I've been doing for the last 45 minutes or so. But um, so this may sound simple and I hope it is simple, but we'll talk again about taking that. So hopefully you you heard my, my last answer on increasing profit you know, or revenue. And, in, and, and reinvesting that money back into the employees. So, so one trend we're starting to see really catch on to help build culture and also help build, I'll say just overall wellness in the workplace because we have so many people that are remote these days. Our programs um, that are called lifestyle accounts, I don't know if you've ever heard of those, Brian, but essentially, you know, it's part of your benefits package. I know this is not necessarily part of the contact center's responsibility or accountability, maybe is so. It could be another program instead of an incentive. It's a program, but think about taking $50 a month or $100 a month and allowing employees to use it in one of 10 ways. So they can use it to pay for a pet care or a yoga class or professional development, you know, for their own skills and they get reimbursed for it every single month. So again, showing that you actually care, you're building a culture of caring and that you understand that people are people, you know, going back to going back to the, the, the front end. It doesn't have to be an exorbitant amount of money, but the, 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 the back, that what you're going to get back because you are offering, again, that kind of culture, that's also going to help you when you're recruiting. Yeah, excellent advice there. And, you know, I could spend many minutes celebrating all the amazing insights you both shared, but to do so would mean to, be, to ignore some of the many questions we have, and I don't want to do that. So I we were way past time, probably don't have time for all these questions, but I want to get to a few. And starting with one here, there's a great one. And so this person, I think, Ryan, you might be the best person to answer this to start off, at least, is they said, you know, we can't rely entirely on agents. We have to rely on self-service, but generally our self-service options haven't been as successful as expected. So what recommendations do you have to improve self-service and bring some of that humanity to the table? Sure. And uh, I realize we're running long, so I'll try to be brief. But I think the first one that that comes out is is knowledge bases um, and knowledge bases paired with AI, if possible. Um, part of part of what we see a lot is knowledge bases um, are outdated. Um, there, there's not really a, ro a robust team um, keeping those up to date as frequently as they need to be products and timing and launches and just general updates that happen um, in the system, they're lagging behind, right? I think, I think as much time as we put into all of the enhancements and all the products and all the, all the things that we support for all of our partners, I wouldn't say one-tenth of that goes into the knowledge base. And if you start to put time into that, driving, driving as much volume towards that self-serve option and if you can pair it with AI, which I know is, is still a relatively sensitive topic and security and all those things that go with it, but if you can find that right balance of, of allowing the right company to come in and look and assess at, you know, even the readability of some of these knowledge bases is not there. They're not easy to navigate. And then if you can layer on some AI on top of it, and even that micro learning aspect of it, I think you can hit a home run there. And that's, that's where I would first go from a self-serve standpoint is go after that knowledge base, look to see if you can enhance it, if you can pair it with AI, even better. So I see a good question here for you, Bonnie, which is you, you mentioned wellness a few times, but can you be specific about any programs or initiatives that will allow companies to increase wellness across their employee population? Yeah, so this has definitely been my theme of the day. So thank you for whoever asked the question, but you know, I guess bottom line, first of all, I thought Ryan gave a great answer earlier when he talked about even his culture meetings. You know, that's that's at least unveiling what's going on in terms of wellness, but hate to be the downer at the end of this, um, this great inspiring um, webcast, but you know, we're in a crisis right now in terms of financial well-being and mental well-being in this country. I mean, globally too, but economic crisis impacts people 
Um, health crisis, I mean, mental health. Um, there was a study that said 84% of the workforce had at least one, men, needed at least one mental health day last year. So there's stuff going on. So what I would say is, you know, this is really about doing things like what Ryan was talking about is having open meetings with managers. It's about training managers too. You know, we know we have some clients we work with, they train on suicide prevention or how do you identify it? Doing Having those tools as Ryan talked about, the, how many people are, are, are giving you a red face three days in a row? Right, so identifying when those when those issues are happening, you know, and having uh, I'll call what we call health navigation in the in the benefits space, having a place where people can go. So it could be digital tools, or it could be health advocates that actually can advise you and guide you. And oftentimes these are a part of an EAP program, or, or they might be a, alongside of it. So giving people channels to have someone to talk to. Ryan, anything you wanted to add there? I know Bonnie gave you a little bit of a shout out earlier, but any thoughts on <laughs> wellness opportunities here? Sorry, Ryan. <laughs> no, it's okay. Um, I, I just think that that if you're listening to this and you're you're leading whatever size team, I would just encourage people to take a giant step back and and self reflect on on the power of of you as a leader and what your the influence that you have. I think consciously many moons ago, I, I, I did the same thing. And I think when you want people, when you're expecting your frontline staff to act and, and to get to that level of customer experience that's exceptional, sometimes you got to ask yourself, are you doing the same things within your own company, within your own team? And if you start to, to really reflect on, on the folks that are, are driving the revenue, the ones that um, really are, are, are paying your paycheck, it it, it starts to become obvious that a lot of companies just expect something from the front lines and then act differently in the management ranks. And, and it's a, it's a true experience that sometimes if you take a step back and really look at it, it doesn't take that much effort to change the little pieces of culture one step at a time. And I, I just would encourage people, it's not for everyone. And to your point earlier, Brian, not everybody will buy into it. And I say that every day. Um, it's optional to join the culture calls. It's optional to participate. I don't expect everybody to be on that train, but I do try to live in that 80-20 space where I think most people want to come to a welcoming environment. They want to be treated the same way that we expect our customers who are calling us to be treated, but they don't want to have that experience any different when they're talking to their manager or boss. It's It's got to be one for one in that experience. So that would be it for my side. Yeah, and we have time for one last question, and it actually is one that we got two variations of this. I'm surprised we didn't get a lot more because I know it's on everyone's mind right now, but is ChatGPT and where you see it factoring into this conversation about maintaining humanity while thinking about some of the economic challenges. Bonnie, why don't we start with you on this one? Yeah, so I am not an expert on the technology itself, but we've been using chatbots AI in our centers for several years now. So I would just say from an advice standpoint, same as we were talking about with the rubric and, and the, the chart earlier, as you're thinking about automation, think about what's going to make the agent's job easier. What is, you know, high volume, repetitive, but I would start with simple tasks, right? Responding to an email, responding to a chat, et cetera, et cetera, test it. But, you know, start small because it's not perfect, right? It doesn't know everything yet it needs to learn. So bottom line is you have to build that learning and you know into, into the environment, whatever tool you're using, if it's chat, GBT or, or another tool, it takes time. So I, I would advise start small, but this is gonna be a game changer, I do believe in terms of agent productivity, because then they can do all the things we've been saying, focus on those you know, highly complex emotional calls. So you really do want the technology to be able to take over and make the agents more productive. Brian, anything that you would add to that? Um, I still throw in the the chat GTP space, the, the security asterisks beside it, because sure. it, 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 there's just a lot of unexplored. And, you know, sometimes I think it's if the, enough people tell chat GP the world is flat, then it'll eventually <laughs> say the world is flat. So I always throw in the asterisks of that. But I, I do see there's a ton of like sentiment analysis, personalized response, you know, getting into like even IVR, logical routing, um, creating customer emails, allowing people to deal with escalations. It, 
it can help enable. And the other part too, you know, if you get into kind of that, that training aspect of how do you want to write curriculum and how do you want to make it more impactful? There are things and threads there that need to be pulled on that I just see unlimited potential on. I think the early stage for me is still a bit cautious. I think we're on the train, but we're kind of beside it right now, watching it a little bit from a distance and saying it, there's a ton of potential here. The micro learning aspect of it really excites me. It could probably rewrite a knowledge base in a, in a better format than, than most humans. But um, I think we're still a little bit cautious there, but the potential of all of those things um, excites me. Like, I mean, it's, it's, it's an exciting next few years on where this is gonna go. Well, that does take us to the end of our webinar. Any other questions? I know Bonnie and Ryan will be thrilled to follow up with via email afterwards, but I do just want to thank them very much and Conduit overall for not only answering the questions and providing great insights, but also a really enriching way of thinking about customer contact and stop thinking about it in terms of specific tasks or specific interactions, or is it simple or is it complex? And instead thinking about what everything means as far as the emotional resonance of your customers and your employees. When you can go above and just solving a problem, instead of saying, if we solve this problem in a certain way, here's how we're going to make people feel. Here's the behaviors we're going to drive down the road. That's when you start to differentiate your organization. That's when you move from selling something to connecting with someone. And when you connect, that's defensible in any economy. It's defensible against competition. It's defensible against maybe some employee burnout here or there. That's what keeps you moving forward. And that's what leads to a great contact center. So again, thank you so much to our speakers. And of course, to everyone who attended for those great questions we received. And on behalf of CCW Digital and Conduit, thank you so much for joining. This has been Brian Cantor. We'll talk to you next time.